Mr. Lee Merritt, how are you doing, sir? I'm well. I'm enjoying the campaign trail in, here in Texas. It's a big state, but we're uh, eating up a lot of road. So first, I got to ask you, are you are you staying safe? You know, with COVID numbers going crazy all across the country, we, we need you out here. So I want to make sure you're staying safe. You know, it's kind of a predicament because, of course, we want to listen to the signs and social distance and, and, and practice all the safety protocols. But I, I don't think that Democrats can win, progressive candidates can win without knocking on doors, being on the ground and, and, and putting together a good field game. It, it's a part of the, our, our road to success. And so we're, we're doing both ends. We're listening to the doctors. We're being, you know, we're sanitizing, we're washing our hands, but we definitely have to get out there in front of the voters. Well, I, I definitely appreciate you taking the time to come on the rematch, uh, basketballnews.com and Fly TV. So um, let, me, let me explain why I, I wanted to sit down and interview, because it's definitely a, a very strategic and pointed reason. So this time last year, um, I interviewed a group of WNBA players, uh, Renee Montgomery and Elizabeth Warren, who uh, both played for the Atlanta Dream at the time, um, T.R. Ruffin Pratt, um, Angel McCoftry, and Eric Garner's daughter, um, Emerald. And we discussed what the WNBA did to galvanize support for Raphael Warnock um, and ultimately um, get him in office and Kelly Loeffler out of office. And it was really it was really amazing, um, you know, because for one, Raphael Warnock was polling at nine percent before the WNBA got involved and, and he won in Georgia of all places. You know what I mean? So I want to see how we can galvanize the NBA to duplicate that with you um, as you're running for attorney general in the state of Texas. So that's why I, I reached out to you to really um, have this interview with you. Um, you know, I, I, I've been following you for a long time and I'm a, I'm a big fan of the work that you do. And and so, you know, I, I'm going to send this interview to the NBA to the NBA Social Change Fund, which is, um, for those that aren't familiar with what that is, it was birthed out of the bubble season um, after the NBA players went on strike, after Jacob Blake was shot multiple times in broad daylight, you know what I mean, in front of his children, and you know the NBA all went on strike. So the NBA Social Change Fund was formed by Chris Paul, um, Carmelo Anthony, and uh, Dwayne Wade, and it's aimed to support critical issues in the black community. So that's why after speaking to um, Alicia Charles Finley, who is Botham John's sister, and I actually interviewed her for my new book, um, Police Brutality and White Supremacy, uh, The Fight Against American Traditions. Um, so she was one of the people I interviewed along with a Tatiana Jefferson's family, who I know that you work with as well. And so we came up with the idea of conducting this interview with you um, to try to galvanize that support from the NBA. So I just wanted to explain, you know, why we're here. Some people are like, all right, you usually do basketball stuff. Why are you interviewing a politician right now? But that that's the reason why. So thank you for taking this time. Sure. No, I, I really appreciate that. During the most of my career, I've enjoyed the support of the National uh, Basketball Association. I, I can recall in 2017, this a young man named Jordan Edwards was slain in Ball Springs, Texas. And uh, it was in the middle of the NBA playoffs. And Steve Kerr, who you know has suffered um, um, family tragedy as well, identified mm -hmm. with that family, reached out, uh, invited them to the playoff games, uh, got his brothers to take their mind off of it for a bit. Um, I actually used to coach basketball myself. I was a coach down at South Atlanta High School. Okay. So I, co I coached Derek Favors. I coached against Cousins and Walls when they were high school students. Okay. Uh, and I, I enjoy a relationship with them today. I continue to give back to the community of Atlanta. And yeah, the, the names that you mentioned that you work with, Chris Paul has uh, supported the work and, and the families I represent, Dwayne Wade and his wife, uh, uh, Gabrielle Union, has been major, major supporters over the course of my career. And, uh, you know, just as I transition away from representing one family at a time and start talking about representing larger groups of people and, and going towards policies, I certainly think the NBA can play a major role uh, in not only the success of the campaign, but championing some of those issues that we're fighting for on a case-by-case on -case basis uh, and taking it to one of the biggest states in the country and, and really impacting national policy. Definitely, definitely. And so let me let me ask you um, to review some of the cases that you've worked on with before um, and the people that you've represented. We could start off with Ahmaud Arbery. Sure. Uh, I came to represent 
the Ahmaud Arbery family before the video was released of his brutal slaying in South Georgia. Um, many of your viewers will recall that he was a South Georgia jogger uh, on February 28th of 2020. I'm sorry, February 23rd of 2020, who was targeted uh, by three white men who have now been each convicted of murder and um, um, are facing life sentences in the state of Georgia, as well as federal hate crime charges. Uh, I've also represented, uh, unfortunately, the list of families that I've represented is quite extensive. I represent over 67 uh, families who have suffered um, misuse of force, uh, have lost a loved one uh, as a result of the deadliest police culture in the world. So some of the names that your viewers may have heard of, you mentioned that Tatiana Jefferson. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, that case is ongoing, both from Shimja, uh, who was an accountant eating a bowl of ice cream in his own apartment complex. Jamel Roberson was a security guard in Chicago. I uh, had just stopped the mass shooting and was shot in the back by a police officer who mistook mm -hmm. him for a gunman. Uh, Sean Montrosa in California. Uh, but the bulk of my, my work has been in Texas. I represent Damien Daniels, a veteran shot to death in his home, uh, Pamela Turner uh, in the Houston area. And like I said, we, we could probably spend the rest of this podcast going through the list of names. Right, right. So, so, so now you're running for attorney general in Texas. And for those that um, don't know, what exactly are the responsibilities of an attorney general? The attorney general of Texas and, and attorney general in any state is the legal voice for the people. Um, uh, it's this, it, they're supposed to serve as the spokesperson uh, for what justice is in a municipality. And so we, we've seen it in cases like Breonna Taylor, where we had a really bad attorney general interfere with accountability in that case in the form of Daniel Cameron. Uh, we've seen the opposite end of that, that spectrum with Keith Ellison and the work that he's done in Minnesota. Uh, prosecuting mm -hmm. the officers responsible for the death of George Floyd and most recently Dante Wright. Uh, but even beyond uh, the criminal justice aspect, the, the Attorney General Office, particularly in the state of Texas, impacts virtually every aspect of Texas life. So property taxes, school protection, and we, we've heard a lot recently in the news about the CRT scam, uh, where they're trying to erase entire portions of our history mm -hmm. uh, in, in the name of um, not getting anyone upset. Um, from the border crisis to really economic empowerment in our schools. There's so many businesses uh, that are that are attempting to get off the ground but don't have access to the kind of governmental loans and support uh, that our white counterparts do. Uh, all of those things run through the Attorney General's office. It's, it's a very, very influential office as uh, more or less the second in command in the state of Texas. Now, Ken Paxton, who you will be running against and who is the current Attorney General and has been since 2015, um, I want to talk about the, the stark differences between the two of you because it's really night and day. But I want to start off with this because, you know, I, we're, we're, we're the January 6th insurrection um, is upon us. And, you know, I'm looking at him, looking at the footage, and I see him um, at a rally right before the insurrection, almost like leading the charge. Like it. Explain to me, you know, let's start off with there about the stark differences between you and, and Ken Paxton. Well, there is a, a clear contrast. You know, Texas was in the national news because of their unique voter suppression laws. Uh, they passed some laws that, that would make it more difficult for the black and brown people in the state, people with disabilities and marginalized communities to vote. It was mm -hmm. so upsetting that um, mem certain members of the Texas legislature left the state and went to D.C., uh, refused to participate in that session. Uh, in order to fight for voting rights. Now, I was present with them. I thought that was a fight worth standing with people for, uh, providing both legal advice and strategies, working with the labor community and others uh, to take on voting issues in Texas. By contrast, uh, the the last sort of infamous trip of the attorney general, the current attorney general, uh, to our nation's capital was on January 6th. Now, we don't know exactly what he did there because it, he has not participated uh, in an ongoing investigation in terms of his potential criminal liability for helping to incite a riot. But he was very publicly on camera uh, uh -huh. encouraging uh, the soon-to-be rioters and insurrectionists uh, that the election was stolen, that they had a responsibility to fight. And he, and he invoked the name of Texas when he did it. He said, you, you all should fight because Texans fight. And he uh -huh. laid out that he had fought uh, to overturn the uh, the results of the a fair, a free and fair election. And yeah, that's, that's our top a legal um, a position in the state uh, advocating for 
the overthrow of our government. I mean, and it's it's just so amazing where you have a party that's so much um, preaching of law and order, um, then support just a lawless act um, such as the January 6th insurrection. I mean, it was like the overthrow or attempted overthrow of democracy. Like everything they claim to stand for, this was the opposite. And then you had politicians in the forefront. But the issue is, are they going to be held accountable for that? That's always accountability. We can go into police accountability in a, in a little while, but let's stay right here with politicians. How are they not being held accountable for inciting, participating in, um, something as massive as the January 6th insurrection. Kim, Kim Paxton has a long privilege, um, a long history of avoiding accountability. He's in fact been criminally indicted for the past five years in my hometown in Collin County for uh, securities fraud charges. A grand jury uh, viewed the evidence. They determined there was probable cause uh, to uh, issue an indictment for his arrest and for his prosecution. It's been five years since he stood trial for that. Uh, he issued a report where he investigated himself using taxpayer uh, resources and decided actually he had done nothing wrong. We've seen that pattern before where law enforcement officers investigate themselves and conclude that their use of force was justified. Uh, you know, we, we talked about both of them earlier. Uh, and the when the Texas Rangers initially investigated themselves in that case, they said, uh, that shooting was justified, that Amber right. Geiger, um, the woman who has now been convicted for murder, had done nothing wrong. And so we see Ken Paxton repeating a culture and a theme of, of really a lack of integrity, a lack of accountability and people who feel that they are above the law. His best friend is Donald Trump. And so that right. makes sense. Right. Right. Um, talk to me about a qualified immunity, because it's something that he is very against. And um, I, I think this is like a step that we have to take in order to get towards police accountability. But where, where are you in challenging qualified immunity? So uh, ending qualified immunity has been one of the major thrusts of what we saw as sort of the freedom summer of 2020. Uh, I'm, I'm working with, again, members in the, of, of the NBA, the NFL, Rock Nation, uh, and organizations all over the, uh, over the country to end qualified immunity. It is one provision of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act that has been proposed but has not been voted on in part because of uh, the Democrats' refusal uh, in leadership, I should say, refusal to deal with the filibuster. Uh, but qualified immunity is, an, is a judicially created safeguard for police officers uh, so that they can avoid accountability when engaged in criminal activity. Uh, they, they get to argue that they, if they believe that they were doing their job, they had a good faith ba basis uh, to believe that uh, what they were doing, although ultimately proving to be criminal, at the time that they engaged in the action, they believed that it was not criminal, then they should be free from the nuisance of suit or harassment by the family. Uh, it is, an, in my opinion, an unconstitutional protection offered to law enforcement officers that allowed them to skirt the Fourth Amendment protections. Uh, and we, we've been challenging it in court and we've had some successes in the state of Texas allowing cases to go forward against brutal police officers, but we really need um, action from the legislator to remove qualified immunity as a protection. You know, it's interesting. Um, you know, I mentioned my book earlier, um, Police Brutality and White Supremacy, uh, the fight against American traditions. And this tradition of police brutality has been going on for a very long time. Um, but it doesn't mean, and I always have to say this, and I don't even feel that we should have to say this all the time. It doesn't mean that you are anti-police because you want police to be held accountable. I, I don't understand why that connection is always, if, if you, if you have, what system is in place where the people are not held accountable and can do whatever they want to do. Like, I don't, I don't know how that could even work. Like, how do you right. communicate that to, to voters in Texas that has nothing to do with being anti-police, but in order for uh, a society to properly function, you need to have checks and balances and accountability all across the board. Well, I really think the answer is to listen to the law enforcement community. Community, something that Republicans actually refuse to do. They they claim to back the blue, but it's by word alone. In Texas, for example, uh, we're dealing with a spike in guns, and law enforcement, the community is forced to deal with that reality, that very dangerous reality for them. And so they've asked for more sensible gun laws where people at least have the proper training and, and uh, they know how to store weapons, they know how uh, to, uh, where it's appropriate to bring a weapon, where it's appropriate not. Uh, Republicans ignored the advice of all the police chiefs in the law enforcement community and passed constitutional carry uh, that would allow anybody at any time to carry a gun. 
uh, with, without any training, licensing, or uh, safeguards in place. And of course, as a result, we've seen an increase in um, uh, gun violence in Texas during a time that it was already spinning out of control. Uh, in, in the same way, if you listen to most law enforcement officers, they'll, they, they will tell you that they don't want to be associated with cops like Derek Chauvin. They don't want to be associated with people like uh, Amber Geiger, that it's right uh, that when an officer abuses their authority and, un and undermines the profession that they be held accountable because they want to maintain the respect in their communities that they signed up to protect and serve. Uh, and these uh, these officers who do not should be, in fact, held accountable. That's what the law enforcement community will tell you. Uh, they don't want their profession to be seen as one that is uh, them versus the community. They, they are members of our community. You and I know police officers, their friends, mm -hmm. their family members. Um, and, and we're going to stop this false narrative that it's us versus them, but it's right versus wrong. And there's so many law enforcement officers that stand on the side of right. Definitely. You know, and one of the things is the messaging. I think a lot of times Republicans are very good at twisting the message. Um, you know, like from what you just said, that that you want people to be properly trained in what instances to be able to use their guns and right. how to use them properly. Now, Republicans take that and twist it and say the Democrats are coming for your guns. You want to like, no, that's, that's not that's not what we said. <laughs> we said properly trained. Mm -hmm. and, and ha so how do you balance that? purposely um, given misinformation, because it seems to be that a lot of people start believing that because you start hearing it over and over again, and they're repeating it as if it were true. Like, how do you battle that? I think more people are convinced by what you do than what you say. And I think when people look at gun violence in the state of Texas and the threat that it poses to their communities, you know, they're, they're less concerned with the rhetoric about who's, who's right and who's wrong. You know, I, I'm a gun owner uh, in my household. Uh, I've trained my, my children who are all elementary age uh, about gun safety. They've gone to the gun range with me. Uh, I, I, you know, it's a part of it's a it's a deeply rooted part of Texas culture to understand guns, to, to have proper gun training. Um, it, the, this wild, wild west ideology of everyone gets a gun and, and consequences be damned is not something that's popular among people. So I, I think we refute the rhetoric uh, by uh, essentially living our creed going out and showing what responsible gun leadership uh, ownership looks like and, and what policies are be um are best to uh, ensure the kind of texas that people want to see um another one of the main um policies or main issues in texas uh, is education um and what what do you propose and what is your plan for the education system in texas and how does it differ from what ken paxton is pretty much promoting well, I mentioned to you that I used to be a basketball coach. I coached at the middle school level, girls basketball in Camden, New Jersey. I coached at, at the high school level. I was at, also an educator at the time, teaching civics in the, at the middle school level, early American history and sociology for, uh, to, to my high school students. Uh, and so a lot of the uh, current rhetoric around what is being taught in the classroom, what are the best practices? You know, when I was a school teacher that came from our school board, we had an elect, elected officials from our communities uh, who helped us determine what curriculum um, was taught. And as an educator and as a, someone professionally trained who had invested my life into the classroom, I got to say into that. Uh, th those directives certainly didn't come from DC or from Austin or from, from a politician. Uh -huh. uh, right now, our current attorney general is suing school districts uh, so that they can't enforce safety protocols to keep their children safe during the pandemic. He's suing school districts to ban books uh, in a way that is reminiscent of Nazi Germany. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he, they, the Republican Party has, you know, they, when you start talking about rhetoric, they want to emphasize that, you know, the left wants to defund the police. Where well, they're defunding public schools with their policies, with lawsuits, uh, they're defunding uh, public schools uh, with uh, this this culture war uh, that they've waged uh, against the classroom. And as Attorney General, I would step in uh, to ensure local control over issues concerning curriculum, over mass mandates, over uh, policy schools are pursuing to keep children safe. Uh, but we also need to, to focus really on how we're funding our schools. And that's Look, that's a long conversation that we can get into. Uh, but mm -hmm. for, for a long time, we, we've relied on, and since before Brown v. Board of Education, we've relied on property taxes to fund our public schools, uh, primarily on property taxes. Uh, what that creates is a disproportionate uh, access to, to resources for schools that are in wealthy communities. Uh, in the inner city communities, our schools are underfunded and uh, undercared for. Uh, we need to uh, ensure a, a funding system for our schools for our schools that 
includes everyone. Uh, that gives the, uh, the all the students a chance uh, to, to a quality education. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned defunding the police, and this is like they, you know, the Republicans are really good at throwing out key phrases to kind of say, you know, Democrats want to do this, and it's like, you know, I, and I spent a whole chapter on this in, in my book, and I'm looking at specific cases, um, you know, where the police are called for nonviolent um, calls, um, where they're pretty much health and wellness calls. Right. Um, the, the, the call is reached out for um, to somebody who's having mental health issues or just a wellness just to check and make sure that they're okay. In um, Tatiana Jefferson's uh, case, um, the, the neighbor called because the back door was open and she wanted to make sure, uh, he wanted to make sure that they were okay, that his neighbor was okay. And right. then the cops came with guns blazing. You know what, in, in, in Vallejo, um, um, Corey McCoy, um, uh, he was the brother of Willie McCoy and Willie McCoy was um, asleep at a Taco Bell and the person inside called and said, OK, the police and said, OK, we just want to make sure that he's OK. And the police came with guns a blazing. You know what I mean? So it's, it's a matter of if the police are not trained to deal with, you know, these type of situations, if you're only trained to deal with the ham like a hammer. And you're going to have everything is going to be a hammer. So if they're not trained to deal with these type of situations, then why don't we put somebody else in charge who is trained to deal with that those type of situations and they get that funding to deal with it? It's interesting because uh, police will tell you they're wearing too many hats. Yeah, they're, 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 we've done we've done you know programs and you know panels and everything like that with police, and they'll all say they've done too many. They're wearing too many hats. But when you say that. The way that it's expressed from the Republicans is just Democrats want to defund the police. You know, what I mean? so how, how do you how do you change that? It's like we shouldn't have to always break this down, but we always have to break it down, and it's still misinterpreted. So how do you communicate what it actually is? It, it's the same simple message: listen to the law enforcement community. The law enforcement community will tell you that our nation is experiencing a mental health crisis like one we haven't seen in a very long time. And mm -hmm. it's in, in part a result of the pandemic and the national uncertainty that results in, in that kind of you know international tragedy. Uh, well, law enforcement community has been uh, uh, given the responsibility of responding to this mental health crisis. They are not mental health professionals. They will tell you this. You know, we don't want to do involuntary committals. We don't. I'll tell you one more story. Dam Damian Daniels is a 30 year old Afghan war veteran who served our country honorably. He, he and his entire family uh, volunteered to join the war. His two of his brothers and his sister went to serve our country during time, times of combat and returned from Gat Afghanistan with some mental health issues, so some PTSD. And he was suffering an illusion and he knew how dangerous it would be to call law enforcement. And so he called the Red Cross and called the VA uh, and he says, look, I just need to get to the Veterans Hospital. You know, my family would like me to get there. And eventually uh, they, he was transferred over to the Sheriff's Department. And unfortunately, you know how the story ends. The Sheriff's mm. Department went to his home and shot him to death on his front lawn. Mm. Uh, the, there was no mental health department able to respond to someone in mental health crisis. Uh, there are other programs that are being uh, pursued in places like Oregon. They have the, um, I believe, Oregon Oregon Star program, um, and it's the idea that on mental health calls, there should be a mental health department that responds uh, right. to mental health crisis. Uh, that seems like common sense. Most mm -hmm. law enforcement communities will agree with you, either a ride-along program or a standalone program for mental health departments. But Republicans have have won the rhetoric war to say, well, that would be defunding the police. No, it would be funding solutions that actually work that are responsive to the demands of the community I, I definitely i couldn't agree more you know so so let's so let's let's go to the, the the nba and how important it is for the nba to continue to promote to continue to 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 use their platforms to be able to um you know i mean it's I, this, this is the thing I, it's, it's important to do that part but now we have to take it a step further and I think the NBA has been, been doing a great job of promoting, raising awareness. You saw all during the, um, especially during the bubble season, after the entire country was um, prom promoting and, and, and demonstrating and protesting what happened with George Floyd, um, what happened with Breonna Taylor, um, you know, Ahmaud Arbery, and everybody was, you, know, you, saw, you saw John Wall and Bradley Bill here in DC leading protests. 
Um, you saw all the Ball brothers. You saw Russell Westbrook in L.A. You saw, you know, Jalen Brown and Enos Cantor Freedom, too, in Boston. You know, of course, yeah. everything that LeBron is always doing. Um, but now it's like it needs to be a step further, like a, the next step. And I think that, you know, you, with, with what you're trying to implement in Texas as the attorney general, is that next step because you have to be able to have someone um, in place that has the that's on the right side of wanting to be able to create something that functions properly. Um, yeah. So just just talk about that. How this is like the next the next step that should happen, along with you know the raising awareness and protesting and everything like that. Yeah, I, I can recall we were in the middle of the NBA playoffs when Jacob Blake uh, was. Uh, repeatedly shot in his back by I was um, by a Milwaukee police officer. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was watching the game and uh, Chris Paul had just gone off, uh, you know, sort of a historic performance. Uh, mm -hmm. And they interviewed him right after the game. And they said, you know, Chris, you know, you're playing. I think he was playing his old team, the Houston Rockets. He was with the uh, uh, Oklahoma City Thunder right now where Derek Favors is currently. And mm -hmm. um, and uh they said, you know, tell us about this this performance against your old team. You had a chance to really, you know, show them that you still got it. And he says, yeah, I don't really care about that. Um, I, you know, that's cool, and that's what I'm I'm paid to do. Uh, but a, a law enforcement officer in my community um, has, has has just shot someone in their back several times. It was unarmed and non and nonviolent. Let's talk about that. I, I think it's on the players to stand up like Chris Paul did, and like you said, like, like people have have done in a systemic way uh, across the National uh, Basketball Association where, where the pundits and the, you know, the media may tell you, hey, could you just shut up and dribble? And we've heard that refrain before. Uh, it's important for the players to say, no, actually, I won't. This is my community. Uh, what's going on in our community is urgent. It's a crisis. It's not something that we want to put off for a later conversation or for the off season. Uh, but where it happens, I'm going to stand up to, uh, to it. And, and I will get involved in elections I, and I will use my, my, my resources and time and uh, attention uh, to, to shine a light on the on these issues that must be addressed. You know, it's interesting um, in my, my, my book, We Matter, Athletes and Activism, I interviewed uh, Javaris Fulton, who is Trayvon Martin's brother. And in the interview, he told me how and, and, he, and when he said this, it, it kind of threw me because I didn't expect him to say it. He said that if it weren't for NBA players and celebrities and everybody like that um, talking about his brother, he didn't think that anybody would know his name. And I was like, wow, that's kind of strong. Why, why do you say that? So then he explained to me how when the when Trayvon Martin was first killed, um, his family was trying to get the local um, news people to cover it and they didn't want to cover it. They said, OK, another young black man was killed. That's not newsworthy. And right. I was like, I was like, that's what they told you. He was like, yes. Video. He said, yeah, he's like that. We don't have no evidence. We don't have no video of it. Just your word saying that he killed. That's not newsworthy. He's and he gave a shout out to the um, like Roland Martin and um, some of the black news um, uh, people who 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 were covering it. But he said, but no local news people wanted to cover it. Yeah. So then he said, but then LeBron James started talking about it and Dwayne Wade started talking about it. And then the entire Miami Heat team posed in the hoodies. So then he said, so then you had everybody like, okay, what is this that LeBron James is, is discussing? And why is Dwayne Wade, you know, feeling so passionate about this and talking about his kids about this case? Then everybody started to 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 gravitate towards it and cover it and everything like that. But he said all before, they couldn't get anybody to cover it. And that's just, you know, it's unfortunate that it is that way because you should have, people should have a regard for human life you know, anyway, without an athlete having to, to, to speak about it. However, the athlete speaking about it is what drew the attention. And, you know, that just shows where athletes have to continue to do that, continue to use your voice and your platform to be able to speak to these causes and also to take it a step further by having laws being changed and people who are in position to fight for laws being changed, like Lee Merritt, um, you know what I mean? And running for attorney general that are in position to actually implement some of the things. So these things don't just continue to keep happening. Yeah, I can remember in 2016, we saw uh, two high profile officer involved shootings back to back. Uh, Alton Sterling and Philando Castile. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was like the same weekend. And it was almost like a dark cloud being hung, hang over 
um, impact the communities. And, 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 you know, if you and I saw each other on the streets, we would make eye contact and say, you know, that, man, this is getting, becoming too much. Right. Uh, and um, um, Dallas had a protest. I, I was living in Dallas at the time. And they had a protest downtown where we marched and we discussed what happened and started to talk about organizing and police reform. Um, and at the end of that protest, a, a vigilante named um, Micah Xavier Johnson uh, targeted um, uh, law enforcement officers and 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 shot five uh, police officers and a couple of civilians as well. Uh -huh. um, and you know, you can imagine the national outcry about Black Lives Matter and. Uh, how they put law enforcement lives at risk, and everyone began to ignore the fact that people were there protesting peacefully uh -huh. um, about police violence that was back to back and overwhelming. Uh -huh. And while it was a tragedy for our entire community that law enforcement officers were targeted uh, by Mr. Johnson, uh, there was also an ongoing crisis in our community that was the reason that all those people had gathered and made targets of themselves. Right. Uh, and, and it was uh, Dwayne Wade. LeBron was still, I think, in 2016 with Miami Heat. So it was Wade and Bron who came forward at the SB Awards that weekend mm. and recentered the conversation mm -hmm. and said, you know, that's terrible what happened in Dallas. And we, we, we back the blue. We stand for good law enforcement officers. But understand that our community is also under attack and it's two sides of the same coin. We don't tolerate violence directed at law enforcement officers and we cannot continue to, uh, to tolerate violence directed at our community and it saved the national conversation so that we could get back to the you know what had brought us all there in the first place and so yeah the uh, members of the nba have the opportunity to have the position uh to really make an impact on how we pursue policy not only in the state of texas but throughout the country that the voices of the nba are critically important to that you know one of the things that you know in working with uh, a lot of the family members of, of victims of police brutality, um, all of them are trying to get laws changed. You yeah. know, they're, they're not they're not they're not pushing for sensitivity videos to be shown. They're not pushing for you know. I, I do a lot of work with um, Tiffany Crutcher, um, yeah. who is the the sister of Terrence Crutcher. I actually went to school with her, uh, Carver Middle School and Booker T Washington High School. Got to give a quick shout out. But yeah, we I knew her, knew her. So yeah. to see her going through all of this and 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 taking on this struggle to change the way that 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 policing is being done in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where we both grew up and and seeing the uphill battle that she has and the resistance that she has. And it's just it's mind boggling the fact that, you know, this would be better for everyone. This would be better for police. This would be better for the white community. This would be better for the black community, the Hispanic community, if policing is done in a sensible way. And that's the part where, you know, we have to continue to keep that message going that it's not anti-police. That's not what it is. It's not pro-police versus anti-police. That's not what it is. The yeah. police are needed and it needs to be functioning in a way, you know, where the police are keeping safe, where they're doing things that they're trained to do, where, 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 where there's checks and balances, where people are being held accountable so that it can function properly. And that's really, that's really what we have to push for. But in order to be able to do that, there has to be laws put in place right. that 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 are different than the archaic laws that were. We have laws put in place right now that are still in place that were back in place during segregation. Yeah. They're not like they're just carryover laws. Like what sense does that make? So really, just pushing to have laws being changed. It's it's it's, it's I can't ex you know express how important that really is in this entire entire picture. No, I agree one hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Well, I, I I appreciate everything that you're doing. Like you said, like I said before, in the, at the top, I'm a big fan of yours and the work that you're doing. And it takes a lot of, I just want to end with this. It, it takes a lot of passion to do what you do. You know what I mean? And a lot of times people discount that. They, they did, you know, to, to deal with the families every single day to, of case. And, you, and it's not like you you deal with the case and then you move on and you never deal with the family again. You're you're in contact with them for life. No, you're, you're, you're working with them and fighting with them for life, to fighting for, to get laws changed for life. Like talk about that aspect and the emotional toll that it does take to have you know so many cases where it doesn't turn out right. You know what I mean? And you have to sit there with the family and talk to them and rebuild their 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 whole 
um, you know, at their spirit after it's broken by being failed by the system. Talk about that aspect, and we can and we can end with that. Sure. So um, it's important to note that less than one percent of, of cases involving an officer involved shooting actually result in any criminal accountability whatsoever. That means it, less than one percent of the cases actually get to trial, and and, and then even fewer actually result in a, in a, a conviction and an appropriate sentence. I sit down and. Um, and talk with families when I when when they first call me about the tragedy, and um, you know I run a kind of different law practice. Over the past few years, we've been able to get uh, national uh, recognition for the work that we do, but we don't operate like a normal civil rights firm. Uh, and I have to sit down and have this conversation with the families. I say, you know, a terrible thing has happened to your loved one, uh, and you you want accountability. You want the officer responsible to be uh, to face criminal charges. Uh, you want the laws to change so that this kind of violence. Uh, it doesn't visit your community again. I want the same thing. Um, in order to get that outcome, uh, it, filing a lawsuit uh, against the municipality, against the police officer, is something that we're going to do. It'll help us get access to the information. Uh, it'll help us identify specifically what policies were violated. Uh, but it won't do justice. The only remedy available in the civil courts is money. Um, and if you want an attorney that's going to hunt down the money for you, um, we're going to file a proper lawsuit, but you probably want to call another firm. We're going to go after the municipality. We're going to go after the police officer. And we're going to look for criminal accountability. And um, un unlike the national average, in the bulk of my cases, from Jordan Edwards, which was the first conviction in Dallas County in 50 years of a police officer, to Botham John, which was the first conviction of a white woman who killed a black man in the state of Texas in its history. Uh, to Tatiana Jefferson, which we have an hist historic indictment, to what we just saw happen in Ahmaud Arbery's case where all three white men went to jail and will be sentenced with life. Uh, our results are about accountability and changes to laws and policies. Um, and so that's where we have to focus our energy. And it's part of the reason uh, that I'm moving into the political spectrum, because I think instead of pulling one baby out of the river at a time, and I, it's great that we were able to get some form of justice for those families. Uh, but we still exist in the deadliest police culture in the modern world. Uh, other countries have done it better. The countries that we compare ourselves with, you know, when, when when looking at how we're doing in the world, we compare ourselves with Germany and Great Britain and Japan and all the other national powers, the world powers. Uh -huh. um, we're, we're in last place in, in terms of policing our community without resort, resorting to violence. Uh, we're, we're, we're the most incarcerated country in the history of the world. In recorded history, no nation has incarcerated more of its people, period. Uh, and we, we incarcerate people for being poor, uh, for being addicted, uh, for for being sick. And and those and we need a better policy. We need a better strategy in responding to uh, conditions created in part by governmental policies. Uh, and we've talked about it long enough. We've studied it. We've learned about it during the civil rights movement. So many people fought and died to get the truth out. Uh, as we see with this whole CRT scam, they're actively fighting combating that truth being discussed in schools. Now that we know the truth, let's stop turning a blind eye away from it and pursue policies that will actually lead to long-term systemic change. I, I believe that includes having constitutional attorneys like myself assume the role of attorney general. Uh, and not only myself, Letitia James in New York, Keith Ellison in Minnesota, Kwame Raul in, um, in Illinois, Rob Botna in California. There is a movement already taking place. Uh, we're asking for the National Basketball Association and anybody else with a platform to join us in the movement because we really can change this country for the better. That's great. That's great. Well, I, like I said, I have nothing but admiration and respect for you and the work that you've that you've done for years and the work that you'll continue to do in the future. And um, I'm going to do everything I can to help support you um, galvanize the NBA. Like I said, that was the reason for this for this interview. I really want to galvanize the NBA support um, around you and for you. And, um, you know, we're in this fight with you. So thank you for everything that you do. Um, I'm going to keep saying, please continue to keep yourself safe because we need you out here. We need you out here fighting for us. So thank you for everything that you do. Thank you, brother. Talk to you soon. Bless All us. right. Bless.